Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about EKG. Now this is out of all topics that I teach for cardiac it has to be hands down my favorite. Now it's not my favorite because it's the easiest one to teach, but it's my favorite because I find it the most interesting. And I think the heart's electrical system is super cool. Um, and when I say it's my favorite, it doesn't mean I'm the biggest expert on it either. Probably I feel more comfortable talking about this than some other, a lot of other topics, but, um, <clears throat> you know, um, there's many different ways to learn things. So, um, I'm going to break down this PowerPoint into smaller pieces than I normally do, um, just to try to, um, hammer out some of these rhythms. So in this lecture, it's going to be broken down, but, um, to start, we're going to talk about some of the basics of what we're looking at and on the ECG. Um, or, uh, you know, uh, the different parts of an EKG. And then I'm going to go into um, different normals, um, you know, like normal rhythms. And then I'm probably going to do uh, like little shorts about each individual rhythm that we're covering for my class um, at this med surge level. Um, and I have some case studies and stuff scattered between um, in between and stuff like that. So hopefully... <clears throat> Hopefully I can get through this without losing my voice apparently um, before I even start, <laughs> but um, it should be um, hopefully a good experience for you. The couple of notes about EKG to get started is just letting you know that it is difficult and it takes repetition. This is something that um, one of those, if you don't use it, you can lose it things that, um, you know, you have to kind of repetitiously practice it, um, be looking at strips and doing it to really keep up with it. Um, and it just takes, um, just like with ABGs, you need a systematic way of doing it. I tried years ago to create like a perfect algorithm, like, okay, first do this. And then if it's this, it's this, this rhythm. If it's this, it's this rhythm. And, you know, there is no perfect way. So I'm going to teach you a couple different things to look for. Um, but then sometimes looking at it, it's just you're looking for what's there or what's not there. And then based on kind of that, it's like kind of a, um, you know, like a <clears throat> narrowing down. Okay, since it's this looks this way, it can't be this rhythm. Since it looks this way, it could be this rhythm. And then you're kind of just going through and um, figuring out if it matches what you think for the uh, the rhythm. So, um, but it will hopefully make more sense as we're going through the rhythms and as you start to learn these rhythms, um, the one biggest suggestion I could give a person who's learning EKG is not to just try to sit there and stare at it. If you sit there and stare at it, um, especially unless you have like, I mean, for me, I just look at it and I can see what it is. I, I don't have to do anything too crazy systematic because I can look at it now. Sometimes I look at one and I'm like, oh, what is that? And you know, then I have to like, let me back up. Um, <clears throat> but um, you know, as a whole, uh, I think that you'll find that, um, you know, the more you look at it, it's kind of like looking at an abstract painting where you're like, what am I supposed to be seeing here? So, you know, don't drive yourself crazy. Start with a systematic method. And then as you become ECG or EKG geniuses, um, you can do whatever you like and um, find your own flow. All right, let's start with the basics. <clears throat> Excuse my, um, my uh, clearing my throat. So first let's talk about the different uh, parts of the ECG or EKG. I'm going to stop saying ECG or EKG. I'm going to just say EKG. Um, know that they're used pretty interchangeably. Usually ECG refers to like when we have someone on a telemonitor and EKG is more what we talk about when we are doing like a 12 lead, but um, tomato, tomato, I promise there's nothing tricky on the exam, um, at least on my exam related to that. So there's going to be different parts and I actually have a slide for each part, but, um, you know, I actually have this cool little, um, I, I finally figured out how to draw without having to like X out of my PowerPoint, like while I'm doing it. So we have our P wave here, um, which is this hill before, Oh, this is fun. Um, wait, God, I, I'm not very tech savvy. So I, when I discover something new, I might get a little excited. I'll be honest. Um, so we have our P wave here, which is our, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, the little small hill before the pointy thing. When you hear me talk about the pointy thing, it's this QRS here. Oh, this is fun. I'm going to stop in a second. The T wave is this here, and I know these are all labeled. Um, we have three main waves we're going to talk about, or com waves and or complexes. And then we have intervals we're going to talk about. Um, and, you know, you can see that the letter corresponds, like there's a 
um, you know, the PR interval is like, uh, probably I should stop drawing on all this because it's going to make it even like worse where you're like, what is she doing? Don't worry. I promise I'm going to break this down. Uh, maybe I should just erase this because I'm getting a little too excited. Um, but yeah, uh, needless to say, there's a PR interval and a QT interval and um, all of these things. And I feel like I want to start the video over because I'm like, man, stop with this drawing. <laughs> So yeah, I promise I won't draw anymore unless it's really necessary. Um, but uh, there's different parts to the e EKG and um, effectively we're going to break down each one because what an EKG is, is a picture of how the patient's electrical activity is working in their heart. And this is really important to know because the heart has multiple functions. It has a electrical function and it has a mechanical function. In order for the mechanical function or the squeeze part to happen, electricity has to send a message for the heart to squeeze. So um, it's really important to understand what you're looking at when it comes to these things and how they're looking. And if they look different or something's off or they're missing or they're pointing in a strange direction, um, you know, a lot of times it can tell you that there's something going on with the heart's electric electrical system. Well, as the nurse, I do not have to be an expert and be able to read a 12 lead EKG perfectly, but I do need to know, hey, that's not right, um, that there's something that's going to go on. Because when it comes down to dysrhythmias, when we go into all dysrhythmias, why do we care? Why am I um, putting you through this misery of learning about this? Um, uh, you know, it comes down to really um, that uh, at the end of the day, if my electrical system isn't functioning in my heart, I might not be getting good muscle um, or heart squeeze or heart pump or cardiac output. Um, and then it's a perfusion problem. So pretty much all EKG um, issues, dysrhythmias um, can put the patient at risk for having very serious issues. I promise I'll stop drawing and getting, you know, trying, I'm going to need to draw some, but I promise I will only do it when it's necessary and not just for fun. Anyway, so um, the, you know, when we look at an EKG, it's on these strips, like we talk about EKG strips. So a lot of people get really hung up on these strips. Now I have, I have some, I have a lot of EKG videos um, since it's my favorite topic, but um, when it comes to uh, the med surge level, we don't go too in depth. Like there's some, you know, numbers we'll want you to know, but you're going to need to know them more when you go to your complex course. Um, but at this level, I do want you just to understand that basically this is the time I need to draw and I might need to change colors because the color that this is. Let me see. I'm going to go maybe to something darker for this one, Ooh, maybe a dark blue. Um, so uh, what do you call them? If I say one small box, it's going to be one of these. Ooh, look at this. All right. I'm going to stop getting excited like a little kid in a candy shop, but I'm a little excited. There's a small box and then there's a large box in these. And if you're wondering like, oh my God, what is this lady talking about? Or what is she doing? Um, I was talking about the electrical system. <clears throat> we're looking for, are, are there all the parts that are supposed to be there? Then we're also looking when we're doing, um, when we're looking at EKG is the reason why we have these special boxes, special strips or special paper that we print this stuff on is because electrical activity needs to be measured in time. Um, Cause when we're looking at all these fancy things like we did on this first page, the P, the QRS, the T wave, um, it, it's all supposed to happen in a certain amount of time. If it's taking too long for these things to happen, it can show a problem. Um, and it can indicate that there's an issue. So um, as a whole, what we want to know when it comes to, um, you know, these strips is that sometimes we, there's certain numbers or intervals or lengths of time that we need to know. So just know in the future, when you see me put like one small box, I'm talking about one of these and it, one small box actually is 0 0.04 seconds. And if I, and most of the, I don't think I talk about small boxes that much. I talk about them a little bit, um, but I will talk about large boxes a few times and that's about um, 0 0.20 seconds. Um, <clears throat> when you get out in practice, you're going to have to do a lot more with this and, um, you have to like calculate six second strips. I'll tell you for, um, our testing purposes, assume everything is a six second strip. So it'll make more sense when I talk about it later. Um, but um, just know the whole reason that there is this type of paper and all of these things is because we are measuring time. So effectively so far to sum up and hopefully to get back to, uh, 
<laughs> get back to some sanity because I feel like it's so hard to teach us without, you know, going deep and just like showing an introduction. So give me a little grace and please keep listening because I promise it gets better. Um, but uh, so far, we I want you to just understand that there are parts to the e EKG um, and that each of them represent a different um, a different part of the electrical system in the heart and um, it's different messages that are getting sent in the heart and tell me how my heart's electrical activity is doing. And I have this electrical activity on special paper um, that tells me lengths of time because sometimes there's a problem with the actual structure. Like I can look at my P wave and something's off. Something's weird with my QRS or something's up with my T wave, but sometimes it's not a problem with the actual, um, you know, wave or complex. And you see here with these things, Things, these intervals, um, sometimes they're too long. It's taken too long for the heart to talk to each other. It's taken too long for the heart to send a message to squeeze, um, which can lead to a lot of issues. So in other words, this measures time. Now, what you would see, like, you know, on our exams, we don't really get down to the nitty gritty and expect you to know, like, in depth of these numbers at this level, but you will need to know them for future semesters. And it's and blink your eyes and you're going to be in complex. So um, don't think that you can just... Um, take a uh, take a little breather and just be like, oh, it'll be fine. Um, it, it's a long time before I need to take that. <laughs> um, trust me, you want to understand this stuff now. Um, and just, and you don't have to understand it in depth, but just understand the basics that it's all about time and that um, we really don't like things to be, we don't like things to be too short, but we worry a lot more if they're too long. Um, and we, that's where most, a lot of our dysrhythmias and other issues come up, but we'll get into that let's start trying to get into some more basics and really start to get into these rhythms. So, uh, sorry, not these rhythms, these parts of the EKG. Um, so like I said, the first, uh, the first part of uh, a rhythm that you're going to look for, um, cause this is a part of that systematic method. What you want to do first is look for a hill like this thing above the pointy thing. So this is what I call the pointy thing here when I'm talking about the pointy thing, but what a P wave is this right here, let me do a big star so that I'm not confusing you with the arrow there. Maybe I should just delete that. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, that um, this thing is um, the pointy thing. Uh, oh my God, I'm going to back up. All right, this is the P wave. All right, sorry, I was thinking about the pointy thing. Um, so this is a P wave. So this is... Um, what you're going to see, uh, look for, usually I look for this first. Um, when I'm looking at a rhythm, I'm like, okay, let me start with my P waves because I just like to go in order. So what you should see here is you should see an upright and visible, like it looks like a hill. Um, know that, you know, sometimes it might be a little pointier, a little rounder, it doesn't matter as long as it's upright and visible. Um, that's what makes for a normal P wave. <coughs> so when you're starting to evaluate a rhythm, what you want to start with is is there one of these pointy things um, a before, uh, oh my goodness, is there one of these hills before the pointy things? Um, and really, if you want to know what's going on here is these P waves, what they represent is they represent that there is the top of the heart is contracting. So when I see one of these, it's like, you know, it might just look like, oh, hey, there's one of those little hill things. But really what the heart is telling you is, hey, um, the message got sent for the top of my heart to squeeze and there was a contraction. Um, so that's why it's very important for us, one, to have P waves because we want the top of our heart to be contracting. Um, but yeah, this is why this is a, um, you know, one of those key things that we want to look at is we want to see, okay, what's going on. This is telling us, um, what's going on in the top of the heart. And we'll talk later about when we have rhythms where there's something weird about the P wave that usually it's a sign that there's a top of the heart or atrial rhythm going on, but we'll get there. Um, but again, P wave, it should be, um, upright, um, little, little hill before the pointy thing, you should be able to see it. And it's a sign, the fancy name for contraction is atrial depolarization. The next thing you're going to look at is the QRS complex. Luckily, they have it highlighted. I'm not going to draw on this one to not get confusing. So um, this is uh, the opposite of the P wave in that it tells me the bottom of my heart has contracted. And the one thing, if you if it helps you to remember it, um, you can kind of think the P, um, what do you call it? And maybe I will draw on this one, but yes, the P wave like looks like a P if you look at it sideways, like if you turn your head sideways. And then, um, so the P wave is for, oh yeah, well, that was, that, that is kind of a cute thing for me to say, but I had a cooler 
other thing in my head, but I don't think it works, but he, this does work. So um, QRS, um, when you look at it, it looks like a V. Um, it looks like it has multiple Vs in it. And what the QRS represents um, is it re represents the bottom of the heart squeeze um, or ventricular depolarization, ventricular contraction. So this is absolutely like, I mean, we definitely want P waves. We want the top of our heart to be working, but if nothing else, my ventricles have to be contracting. Remember ventricles are the powerhouse in the heart. So if they're not squeezing, it's definitely not going to be, um, there's no cardiac output happening. So, um, in other words, we can have problems with our P wave and still live, uh, problems with our QRS. Mm, we're getting into like death territory. Um, but if you, if it helps you to think about that, it's kind of shaped like a V for ventricular issues. Um, that might help you. I was trying to think of something like the P wave and like P stands for something for the top of your heart, but maybe just the fact that top, the P at the end of the top is stands, mm, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try to make it work. Um, some things works, some things don't. One day I'll maybe come up with something better. Um, but getting back to the QRS, um, we definitely obviously want these. What they should look like is they should be present. That's most important. And it should be skinny. So here's one thing I do want to tell you. Um, when I say skinny, it goes back to that thing I was saying about the boxes. <clears throat> the normal is um, there's three small boxes. So bringing you back um, to this first, uh, this, this slide. Um, you know, a QRS should not be bigger than, I'll go back. Oh, oh, I think I had actually blue is the color I had this dark blue. It shouldn't be more than like three of these boxes. Um, cause four times three is 12. If that helps you remember it. So here's the thing is we're not going to give you one on an exam and you have to sit there and measure it. And if like, you don't measure it, then you're going to be like, oh my God, um, I got it wrong. Like, you know, like, because I couldn't measure the boxes, we're not going to give you one. It's going to be very obvious if it's skinny, like this is a skinny QRS and we're going to practice later. What's a skinny QRS and what's a fat QRS. And you'll be able to see, we're going to give you really obviously one where it's either like skinny or it's fat. It's going to be very super obvious. Um, but, um, those are the only two things. The thing that always throws people people off with the QRS as you're seeing these is sometimes they can be pointed in the other direction. So sometimes they can just go down. Sometimes they're just pointed up, um, you know, so just know that they can go in different directions, but it doesn't matter what direction they're going in, but as long as they're present and we want them to be skinny, that's what we're hoping for with the QRS complex. And again, this is my showing my powerhouse or my ventricles are squeezing, contracting. And, and I, I should say this, let me back up and say this, is that this is the electrical activity. I can have electrical activity, no actual squeeze. But this is showing, hopefully, <laughs> that um, we could, as long as we don't have pulseless electrical activity, um, that there is, um, what do you call it, a contraction happening. The electrical activity is sending for a contraction to happen. So hopefully, as long as my heart muscle is um, working and functioning correctly, there should be a heart squeeze. Um, but this is where I'm looking for how my ventricles are doing. So remember P waves, how is my atria or top of the heart doing? QRS, how is the bottom of my heart or um, ventricles doing? Then we also have the T wave. So this one is not connected to a certain part of your heart, but think of your T wave as your rest period. This is the period where, um, and I call it the toilet for a reason, I'll explain in a minute. Um, but um, this is the period where your heart should be resting. It's called, you should also think of it like the refill, uh, refilling um, period. It's the period where um, your body is getting ready to take that next heartbeat and it really needs to rest. Um, your T wave uh, is like the reason I call it the toilet is because I really think because someone explained this to me once when I was in an EKG class and it just makes total sense to me is your T wave is the time your um, heart's supposed to be resting. So think of it like when you flush your toilet, like let's say that um, you need to flush twice because maybe you got some extra toilet paper, stuff like that. So you flush your first time and you're waiting for the toilet to refill. This is what the T wave is. It's like when you're waiting for the toilet to refill. Now, if I flush after I've just flushed my toilet and I try to flush again, um, you know, it can lead to like my toilet's getting all upset. It's gurgling and making a bunch of noise and um, getting pretty pissed off. Um, it's not going to give me a really good flush because it's like, hey, man, I'm still refilling. Um, so the T wave does not like to be bothered. So the T wave is just like a toilet because it doesn't want to be flushed during that time time. It's supposed to be resting. Um, 
And um, like I said, even if let's say you wait a little bit, but you, um, you don't, um, you know, you try to flush again before it's ready to it's fully refilled, then a lot of times it's going to maybe work, but um, it's, you're not going to get the same flush or think you're not going to get the same contraction um, because it's supposed to be resting. So this is the resting time. There really shouldn't be a lot going on, um, it, you know, it, during this time. And so when, when you learn about um, well, we'll talk about it in the next slide. I'm going to talk about that anyway. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's why I call it the toilet is effectively it's your resting time. It's a time not to be bothered. It's a time when the toilet does not want to be flushed again. Um, and if you don't flush your toilet twice, then, um, I'm sorry if that analogy doesn't help you and, um, good luck to you, but sometimes we need to flush twice. Um, so, uh, what do you call it? The other things to know about the T wave is it should be upright and present. So you should always have a T wave. Um, uh, you know, unless you have some really, really deadly rhythms, um, and, um, it should always be upright. And, um, so other times you would see it not upright is we can sometimes I'm looking for my thing here. Where is it? Okay. There it is. All right. Um, sometimes what can happen is we can have T wave inversion where it actually goes upside down. So sometimes you can have a T wave and I don't know well, now it's going to make it look like there's craziness. Maybe this pen was like a bad decision. Like, you know, the day decided to like, look this up. I think I'll help in other things, but I'm not going to draw on this for this one. Um, but anyway, sometimes it can be upside down. Um, sometimes it can just be depressed um, where I know I just said I wasn't going to do this, but you get the point. Sometimes it can be where I have an upright T wave, but this, like this kind of points down. There's like, T, there's like a depression in the T wave. Um, and then um, so upside down, da, 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 da. yeah. And then sometimes you might see what's called peak T waves where they're up a little bit higher. They're like really high peak uh, T waves. Sometimes that can be a sign of like high potassium and stuff like that. Um, so it's always possible. Um, you know, there's a variety of things Now we're not going to get too in depth with the T wave. Um, since we don't talk about heart attacks, we're not expecting you to know a lot about this ST segment and um, ST elevation and ST depression and um, uh, you know, inverted T waves or peaked T waves and stuff like that. We do under, we do want you to understand hyperkalemia. So it's the only thing I could possibly think we could possibly, I'm going to stop saying possibly test you over is going to be this peaked T wave, which can be a sign of pot uh, high potassium. Now we wouldn't give you a picture and expect you to identify it, but if you see the word peaked T waves, you should think peaked the P is, um, is potassium to think potassium to T waves. Um, so peaked is potassium to P T waves. So, um, but just know that effectively usually once this upright and present now there's no rhythms. We talk about this semester where you're going to need to know much about the T wave when it comes to abnormalities. But if, if I don't teach you about them now, and then you get to complex, you'd be like, Psh, I didn't even know that existed. So you definitely want to understand that it's the rest period. Um, it can show signs of previous heart damage or current heart damage. Um, you know, like we have ST elevation and heart attacks and things like that. Um, and just know it's a, it, it's the, you know, that time where the toilet should not be flushed again, which will make sense when we talk about this next slide. So, so far we've just talked about the waves. We've talked about um, the P wave here, the QRS up here, the pointy thing, and then the T wave here. Um, so we have our three parts, but then I, like I said, we're looking at time and sometimes the time that things take to happen or talk to each other. Like for example, this PR interval is the time it takes the top of the heart to tell the bottom of the heart to squeeze. Um, if there's something off with that, it can definitely lead to, um, rhythm issues, but even more, um, this QT interval, you're going to see this mentioned a lot in drug books. You're going to see people talk about like, Ooh, if they have a prolonged QT interval, it's really super dangerous. Um, uh, or like these meds cause a prolonged QT interval. And what they're talking about there is QT interval is really, um, you know, how long it takes the ventricles to do their job. And then how long it's taking, um, the, that toilet to refill. Now, if that toilet's taken a long time to refill, man, my heart's going to Get impatient. It's going to say, man, you're taking way too long to refill. And so um, a lot of times what can happen is this, if you have a prolonged QT interval, you're more likely to have dysrhythmias. So to put this into a, a nursing scenario for you, that which might make more sense is you want to think about if I'm given a bunch of meds that can make that interval longer and longer, and a lot of meds can do that. 
Um, if I'm given a bunch of those, then it's going to take their heart longer. Like their heart's going to be relaxing longer, which sounds like a good thing. Um, but it actually severely increases my risk for them going into VTAC or having, um, an abnormal rhythm. So um, the pharmacy actually watches this and they will only allow so many meds to be prescribed that have a prolonged QT interval. Um, let's see. So I have the normals here. The normal PR interval is less than 0 0.20 or one large box, which makes it a lot easier to look at, um, which, uh, you know, I might erase these and show you here so you can see a little bit better. Eraser, don't fail me. Um, and so, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, when I say one large box, so this is the beginning of my P interval and it's going to here, you know, so we are exactly like the size of one large box. Um, and then the QT interval is about the size. It can be a little bit longer. It's 0.43. And remember each box, these are 20. So I think 20, 40, um, but it, it needs to be less than 0.43. So you can see this one is, um, right at like 0 0.40. So it's a good size. Oh, that's not pretty. Um, wait, oh yes, that's what I want. So, um, but, um, you can see that this is two boxes. So again, you're not going to have to measure these for this class. So you can, um, you know, put your inhaler down and breathe again. Um, but it's just good for you to start to look at this and see like, okay, this is telling me about time. Oh, this is about how long this is supposed to be and start looking at what's normal, um, what's abnormal. One last thing that we're going to look at is RDR interval. And this is going to be really key for this semester to understand. I just want you to visualize it. We'll talk more about it later. RDR interval is the space between the tip of the pointy, each pointy thing. And um, I, it's not about the time. I don't want you to know what the normal is or anything like that. You don't need to know that. But it's just to know what's regular, irregular. So normally between each pointy thing, like if in my rhythm, there's only two beats here. But in, um, let's say there were three beats here, there should be the same amount of space. So this space here and between should be the same between each beat. So um, later when we talk about our rhythms, regular or irregular, um, what we're talking about here is um, that they are the same space um, in between each of the pointy things. Um, and that like pretty much, like in other words, it should march. When I say it marches out, I mean, it's like same, same, same space, same space, same space. So like, cause if you listen to someone's heartbeat, it's not, it's not supposed to be irregular. It should be very like bump, 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 bump. Bump, bump. Like it's very like musical rhythmic, um, same, um, uh, same pattern. Um, so again, you don't have to measure boxes, but, um, what I've, what I used to do when I was in nursing school, or when I was an e take an EKG test is I would literally, um, sit there and like mark on the first, um, pointy thing and the next pointy thing. And then I would take my piece of paper and just kind of compare and make sure it was the same distance between, um, every QRS. Again, we'll get more experience doing this a uh, little bit later and it should make some more sense. So let's make, uh, to do some practice marking these rhythms, um, all the parts, so for this first one, let's see if I can find my little thing. They have this thing so small. So I've got my P wave here. I've got a Q, all these are QRSs, but I'm just taking some space. And then I have a T wave. Now this is a pretty big T wave. I would almost say that this is like a peaked T wave, but I'd have to compare it to their normal. So I've got my P wave, I've got my QRS, and I've got my T wave um, on, let's see where my marker thing is here. Here's a good way for, this is a good one to show R to R. So you see there's the same distance here as there is here. So you can practice this yourself too, um, if you'd like. These are on your fill in the blank notes too. So if you wanna do it on your own paper and like print it out, I find it helpful. So there's the same distance. So in other words, like this would be the R to R. Yeah. Do, 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 do the R to R. Here's all the same. Um, you can also practice marking your other intervals. So it's hard. Um, it's like, I'm having to look in real close. So when I'm, when I'm measuring, like try to find my PR interval, I try to find one that starts near the, the beginning of this. So my PR interval is like here to here, here or something like that. And then my QT interval is going to be like, like this one, it kind of ends here. See how that one's about. Let's see if I can go up. QT interval. So this is I'm gonna put on the market QT. 
like the gas station and then PR interval. But these are just here to give you practice because I find that it's helpful to kind of look and see, okay, let's bring it all together and um, what are things supposed to look like? So we're gonna get a lot of practice with this. If you are lost or if you've already turned me off and then you you know, you maybe cursed my name and then you turn this back on um, or if you wanna cry or die inside or give up on life, please bring your hope back, it gets better. I'm really talking about like, you know, basic concepts here. And it's really hard to talk about. Um, and then we're going to actually get into um, getting some practice. And once you see this over and over and over again, and we put it into practice, we're drawing on these things, it will make a lot more sense. And I promise the drawing will be better. Um, so overall, to put it all together, um, you have your P wave to start um, here, you know, this um, small hill, um, you have your PR interval, which is from the beginning of your P wave to the beginning of your pointy thing. You have the R to R, which is the space in between the pointy things to see if it's regular or not. So yeah, P wave, sorry, P wave, top of my heart is contracting. Do I have a top of the heart problem? PR interval, how long is it taking the top of the heart to talk to the bottom of the heart? And I have my QRS, which is the bottom of the heart contraction. Um, and then I have my, um, you know, QT interval, which helps to um, uh, tell how long it's taking for my heart to rest till that next beat. My R to R, which tells if the rhythm, like, you know, uh, you can say um, R, -R, R to R stands for is the rhythm regular. Um, if you want to remember it that way, the distance between it, um, then I have my T wave, which is my toilet when my heart should be resting, nothing should be flushed during that time. All right, I'm going to stop this one and um, we're going to start up the next one. The rest of them will be a lot more short, sweet, simple to the point. Um, and um, hopefully I'll do a better job in my head. Like it makes total sense. I'm like, oh yeah, this is, it's going to be so simple. They're going to get it. Um, then I start talking and I'm like, blah, blah, blah. but just know um, this is a, one of the hardest topics to teach. I'm doing my best and I hopefully got through something to you. Um, but if not, you can always skip this part and go to the other parts and come back to this if something doesn't make sense. All right, I'll see you for the next one.